Thank you. <laughs> so let's get that up. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm Jin from Mematic.ai. Uh, I see a couple of familiar faces, so possibly some of you guys have seen this before. Uh, so word of warning is kind of a bit of a high level kind of overview kind of talk. So uh, more focused on problems, but we've built this all in Ruby. So after that, happy to take some questions. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Minutes. Cool. Uh, so what's the company do? We, we build assistance that increase productivity, right? That's our passion. Uh, because we want to give everyone time to do things that they love. Basically, we're lazy. Machines should do stuff for us. Uh, this is a bit about me, engineer, Yahoo, whatever. Uh, let's skip to the interesting bit. What is AI, right? I mean, and I always start with this because whenever we talk about AI, uh, it conjures up a lot of images in people's mind. And, and most of the time, what people think about, I mean, it's nothing new, right? And the whole point of this slide, it's, it's, it's been around, this was coined in 1956, obviously work on making intelligent machines has started uh, way before that. Uh, but whenever we talk about AI, this is what people think about, right? They think about Terminator, they think about her, they think about Scarlett Johansson, and someone you can fall in love with and talk, talk to. Uh, but the reality is a bit more like um, this today, right? I mean, chatbots are a huge, huge uh, space right now. Everyone wants to do them. Uh, but the reality is that they're kind of really a little limited. Uh, today, right? So if you go off the rails, um, they aren't really able to respond. And that's simply just a fact of the state of the art, right? I mean, no one really knows how to build a truly flexible thinking machine that incorporates all the kind of world knowledge that we have and that can kind of really respond to you intelligently outside kind of certain bounds. So um, another quick thing about what's an agent versus a chatbot. Uh, so here's a chatbot says schedule a meeting for us next week uh, and you, know, you notice this is a pretty broad broad statement right you didn't say when uh, but it turns out that, you know chatbots today tend to function a little more like IVR agents right so they want to know like something specific that you want them to do so they need to know like what day right so maybe you suggest two days and that's still not good enough uh, and then they want to know what time so it literally if you try this with Siri this is exactly uh, what you would get, right? I mean, Siri will actually ask you for specifically when you would like to have this meeting, and then it will proceed to e send a calendar invite out, right? At which point you're like, done, I'm done with this, right? And I, I forgot to set the context. Uh, this is basically kind of a busy executive. You're really on the run. You're just shooting emails off. Um, and what you really want to do is to hand this off to an agent. Now, the difference is an agent takes ownership and, and it's autonomous, right? So it, it makes decisions on your behalf. Uh, so you throw a task, it's ambiguous, it's ill-defined, uh, relatively speaking, and then, but the agent says, okay, fine, uh, let me go figure this out, okay? Uh, and it goes off, it emails the people on your behalf that you wanna meet, uh, figures out time based on your calendar and their responses, and says, okay, I've confirmed the meeting, Monday, 3 p.m., sent the, uh, sent the invite out, uh, and you know, if you work in the corporate world, you know a lot of people live and die by their calendars, right? So that's the difference uh, between an agent and a chatbot, and obviously what we're building is closer to the agent side of things. So I have a quick video that will introduce Evie to you guys, that will set the stage, and then we dive a bit deeper. Um, which doesn't play, which never plays. Let's see if we can figure this out. All right.
Okay, great. So it's built with Ruby, of course, but there is a slide missing, which is all right. Let's so let's around in a sec. Right. So just a quick recap, as you saw, Evie's really this AI assistant. It reads and writes emails, right? So you notice uh, there wasn't anything special that the users need to do. They email the person they're talking to, or they want to meet. Uh, and then you just copy Evie into the email like a, like they would a real assistant, right? So if you if they had a real assistant, that's exactly how they would interact, right? Uh, and you know, and Evie takes over from there, interacts like a real person, looks at their your calendar, sends you uh, sends them some times. They can respond uh, using natural language, and they can literally say anything they want, right? There's no keywords, there's no kind of boundaries, uh, and Evie would just handle it like like a real assistant would, yeah. Uh, and of course, it's built with Ruby, uh, mostly. It's a little bit of Python in there. <laughs> uh, and so, and you know, a lot of people say, well, that's a strange choice, right? Um, because Ruby isn't usually the language that, that people use to do natural language or to do uh, any sort of machine learning or anything like that, right? So why did we pick Ruby? Um, very simply, speed. Right, and and speed is not something you associate with Ruby, but uh, in terms of raw performance. But what we we are doing is so we're building a ton of these algorithms from scratch. Right, a lot of the natural language algorithms, a lot of the scheduling algorithms, we've built we've built and rebuilt multiple times. Uh, and the choice of Ruby was really to allow us to iterate really really quickly. Right, uh, and to to build something like a a tiny mini. Hadoop style thing that's that totally integrated into your code base, and you can do that in in less than a week. Uh, in fact, you could probably do it in a day or two in, in Ruby, uh, which implements some sort of parallel execution or some sort of uh, kind of uh, map reduce type uh, implementation at a small scale, right? So it, it lets us iterate very very quickly, because um, literally this is new stuff, right? I mean, I think no one's really built a kind of fully automated AI. Uh, and a lot of things that we need to try and, and throw out or you know we've rebuilt algorithms at least three times I think for scheduling and I think our, our natural language algorithm is on to its like fifth iteration uh, and that doesn't count all the incremental kind of stuff that gets built on top of it right so so that's uh, that's Ruby so now I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just talking a little bit about the challenges of natural language processing right uh, which we call speaking human um, so, let's take a very simple example. Um, someone says, let's meet for lunch, right? And implicitly, between you and that person, you know that lunch is typically a meal and it's somewhere between 12 to 2, uh, and you actually have to usually meet in person for lunch. Now, a machine knows nothing about this, right? So the first thing you need to do is encode all this information uh, into Ruby, uh, sorry, into, into code, right? So you have to have some sort of uh, ontology that you, or a dictionary if you will, and Ruby makes it really easy to do this because hashes are really easy to manipulate, right? Uh, and it's got a great syntax, uh, very elegant, and you really get to just say what you mean. So it really makes it easy for us to encode this sort of information uh, and manipulate it, right? Uh, then you have to think about syntax versus semantics, right? So consider I'm free at five, but I have to run at six. This means really you want to meet at five, but it's got to end, it means it's got to run end at six. And you compare that with I'm busy at five and I'm available at six. Uh, so a lot of traditional syntactic analysis tools that exist in natural language today uh, are able to tell you the syntax, right? This is a noun, this is a verb, this is the dependency graph, uh, but uh, what they can't tell you is that, in fact, 
although these two look syntactically similar, they're actually, in, from a meaning perspective, almost entirely opposite, right? So if you run a traditional uh, uh, word to vec uh, program, which is a fairly common, common first step in, any, in a machine learning kind of pipeline uh, for NLP, you'll find that these phrases are gonna come out looking very similar in a, in a vector space, right? Um, so we need to basically write our own custom algorithms on top of this, combine that with the ontology to be able to dis make these distinct crunch, right? Um, and you know, you don't know. If so here's another example. Let's meet Thursday or Friday afternoon works. Really simple sentence, again, effortless for a human to process. You know exactly what this means. But let's consider, right, that the machine really just sees this as a sequence of symbols. So uh, first of all, Friday and afternoon need to be joined together. You're really talking about Friday afternoon. Very straightforward. But then you need to look a little further and realize that, hey, that the word afternoon, although it's a little ambiguous, probably belongs to Thursday as well, right? So you need to kind of look at how you can group stuff. And then on top of that, you then have to take this entire Thursday or Friday afternoon a chunk and treat that as a single unit, right? And use that and say, hey, this person is saying that both Thursday and Friday afternoon work, right? And again, you can imagine how, um, you know, using the, the, the Ruby hash format, it's really easy to combine these things and, and kind of construct a structured representation of what Thursday or, or Friday afternoon really means, right? Um, and so I think that has really kind of paid a lot of dividends for us. Um, here's another example of another different sort of problem that we need to deal with. Let's do coffee at Holland Village, say Starbucks or Yahoo, okay? So a few things we need to pass out here. Besides the natural language syntax and structure, there's an implicit relationship here. First of all, Holland Village, HV, in the Singapore context, means Holland Village, right? That isn't necessarily the case for uh, someone in San Francisco or in Seattle or New York, right? Uh, so we need to have very, very uh, region and city specific uh, dereferencing or co-reference resolution to be able to decode something like HV and put it in the right context. In fact, this might even vary from person to person, right? Uh, so that's the first problem then you need to recognize that there's an implicit relationship that Starbucks is a very specific venue within Holland Village, the area, yeah? Uh, and the same thing with Yaku. And so you know that there are actually two kind of proposals here, right? It's Holland Village at Starbucks or Holland Village at Yaku, yep? And again, I love hashes. They allow us to just throw stuff in, um, and add more and more resolution to a particular location as you build it up, right? And as you read the sentence, you just add more attributes to it. As long as you've got your, your schema done uh, properly, you can actually do this fairly simply. Here's the last problem. Uh, and now we go a little bit beyond just the surface level reading of language. I'm in Hong Kong next week. So subject, this is a fact, right? This is simply a statement of fact. Uh, so you need to first be able to take that sentence and turn it into a structured representation, which is the fact, right? That, hey, I'm in Hong Kong, so the person who's speaking, the first person uh, form, uh, is saying that this person's in, in Hong Kong, right? And you can have some details about Hong Kong. And again, uh, there's a validity now attached to this fact. So you first need to capture this, store it, and then you need, then need to reason, reason from this because it depends very much on what you're trying to do, right? So in the context of an AI meeting assistant, chances are we're scheduling a meeting. We need to now bring in the context of the conversation and figure out where is this meeting, right? Is this meeting going to be in Singapore? Am I organizing a meeting in Hong Kong? Um, is it a call, right? Um, does this person have any uh, personalization parameters, right? It's like, oh, well, no calls beyond a certain time, or, or I'll, I only do calls on Monday, Wednesdays, or Fridays. Um, and only after you take the, the, the context plus the fact, 
are you able to make some decisions? So there's another kind of big brain there that, does, that makes these decisions. It says, takes the fact, takes the context, reasons from it, and says, well, you know, maybe I need to propose a time next week because it is in Hong Kong, so it's a great time. Or maybe I need to find another time range because it's not a good time, right? Or I need to change the meeting to a call. So there are various actions that you can take, uh, and it all starts from just one single sentence. You can trigger this um, kind of, not a cascade, but literally a, a sequence of events that, that could result in a decision where you might say, well, I want to reschedule a meeting, or I'm going to turn it into a call if it's urgent, or I'm going to move it to another time, right? So at a higher level, this is kind of what, it, what the natural language pipeline looks like. And it's, uh, as I said, all built in Ruby, uh, with the exception of the off-the-shelf components. So the tokenizer and POS tagger are off-the-shelf, and this is one of the components that are actually, it's actually running in Python right now. But the reality is it could run in Java, it can run in uh, C, it can run in whatever natural language library uh, we happen to have it connected to. And the reason for that is because these are fairly well-solved problems in academia, right? I mean, you can get really good off-the-shelf tokenizers and positive speech taggers uh, that will basically break a sentence up into its constituent words and tell you, you know, within some level of, of approximation or accuracy what part of speech each word is, right? Uh, and these in and of themselves are the product of kind of 30 years of, of research and you know, they all incorporate kind of the latest machine learning techniques and some of them, I think, if you guys follow the space, Google's Parsi, Mac Parsface or um, model has uh, uses neural nets as well to help with some of the decision making. Then the rest of it is entirely uh, a customized NLP stack that we've built. It's got an ontology that looks up uh, things like lunch and kind of enriches it um, and then we've got a semantic chunker which really uses meaning to kind of group to group uh, words together uh, then we do entity detection so this is the Holland Village example uh, and then we build kind of a graph of the sentence and not only of the sentence but across multiple sentences right so if you think about it we're reading entire email, we're looking at sentence one, sentence two, sentence three, and we're kind of constructing information and, and uh, actions and, and data from these series of sentences, right? Uh, and so that's the graph builder and then the information uh, synthesis piece of it. Uh, <laughs> I have to compete with that. Uh, then we route, so I'm going to try. Uh, we route, which means looking up the context that I talked about. So putting the, 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 the message that came into the right context, right? What task is it talking about? What was proposed? Where's the meeting, etc. We bring that context in and then we enrich it, right? And that's the last box in. And then we end up with the structured language uh, represent representation that's really the machine readable understanding of what this message means, right? Uh, and that's really the, the natural language pipeline that we built to handle this, right? And that's just understanding language, right? Uh, then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. We talked, I talked a little about the scheduling algorithms and how it needs to take into account a whole bunch of different things. Uh, you know, for example, in a very naive scenario, machines don't understand human notions of time, right? So you say, hey, let's meet next week. Well, what's next week? Well, is that midnight on Monday, the first day of the week? Not really, right? I mean, there's whole kinds of various factors you need to consider, time zones, how do you do that in a scalable way? Um, and I think Ruby was really great in, in helping us kind of experiment with different architectures for doing this. Um, location modeling, uh, we, talked, we talked about that when we are talking about language as well, but uh, aside from the language, you also need to have a way to represent this in terms of database structures and, and looking up stuff in a, in a tiered and hierarchical manner. Uh, dynamic workflows, so lunch, coffee, meeting, all that, and then natural language generation, right? So each of these are like a ton of boxes and that are handled by one of these, right? So, um, so the natural language piece is really this box over there, right? So that's condensed in here. So this is kind of a broader view of the entire system. We start with the IO layer on the left. So you notice that in, in the current iteration, uh, current version of the product, we take email input, uh, but really the app, 
the application's been designed to take any kind of textual input, right? So it could take text from instant messages, uh, Slack, etc. Uh, so there's a generalized, virtualized kind of I.O. layer that we've abstracted away. Goes into the natural language engine, the routing engine, and then it goes into the, the task manager that obviously kind of just looks at which task it's, it's in, what state it's in, what workflows we are, location, location classification, understanding. So that would involve, again, taking HV and translating it into something meaningful. Uh, you have a meeting room in your office named Hong Kong. Well, that's something that we're responsible, the locus component is responsible for transforming into, you know, you're kind of establishing probabilities, right? Is this Hong Kong meeting room or is this Hong Kong the country, right? Uh, Dash is our scheduler. Uh, P39 is our personalization engine. So no meetings on Mondays or I'm okay to travel on Tuesdays, but on Fridays I want meetings in my office. So uh, there are lots of rich uh, personalization that, that it turns out users want uh, for scheduling, for an AI scheduling system to be useful. And we couple that with world models, right? And, and world models is really uh, what we're saying something like if I'm scheduling a meeting and I say, hey, uh, I'm talking to someone else or two you and say, hey, I'm in Hong Kong next week, right? The next meeting I schedule, Evie should really know that I'm in Hong Kong next week because I've told her in a different task, right? In a different email. So you, are, you always have to establish this memory uh, and this, this kind of model of the world where people are and when they are in different places. And it's really a very dynamic environment that we have to keep track of, right? The sync engine is uh, maintaining synchronization with the user's calendars, right? Uh, and this again was where Rubo is really useful because it turns out that synchronization is actually a fairly common operation in, in a lot of things, uh, that at least that we, we, we do. So we were able to kind of abstract the whole synchronization logic out as a module uh, and literally just throw that into any class that needed the standard kind of like uh, what's been added, what's been deleted, what's been changed, and kind of like an automated CRUD uh, infrastructure. Uh, all right, so all this is kind of the brain that makes decisions. And then at the end of making decision, if you need to send an email out that goes into the natural language generation engine, we haven't talked much about it, but it's also kind of, that's worthy of another uh, kind of deep dive at some point. Uh, and then flex message is really our, our, our uh, abstraction layer because again, we need to be able to say that I didn't want to rewrite, we didn't want to rewrite the code or rewrite the logic if we're talking to someone on SMS or short message, just like chatbots or, or Slack versus a full email, right? So you want to be able to say the same things, but the way you would say it will be, be increasingly, will be pretty different depending on, on the channel you're talking to, right? So basically we've abstracted away that in the, in the messaging layer, and then that just goes to the generalized out IO layer for our, right? Uh, and so that's really like kind of the end-to-end -end -end architecture. Uh, we're obviously hiring as well. Uh, we just raised a seat round uh, a few months ago. And um, we're looking for software engineers, NLP researchers, and of course, anyone interested in machine learning. Uh, right, so that's us. So, questions? Thank you. Yeah. She's interacting with your customer and presumably their customers. Right. So how, how do you, what kind of feedback do you have in place to, so that you guys can be told when she does something wrong? Yeah, um, so a lot of the, the feedback, so there's, there's actually a supervisory loop, right, where, so it turns out that people don't like it when assistants get things wrong. So you can't actually afford to have it go out and do something wrong. Uh, you have to catch it beforehand. So uh, until she's good enough, there's still people in the loop who kind of uh, verify that things look good. There's also, one of the things we're looking at is a, uh, and actually in the process of building, is kind of a separate guard, uh, um, kind of like the way the Apollo computers, right? You'd have like two computers compute the same thing, and if the numbers agree, then it's good. Uh, but if you have, uh, in our case, we're using two different methods, and if they come up with the same thing, then it's all good. If they differ, then it's like, hey, okay, maybe someone should look at this, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Can you do your batch slides? Sure. So, the IO layer, I yeah. generates the hash to me about. 
Uh, not really. I mean, the IO layer is just responsible for taking input from email versus Slack yeah. versus yeah. So you were saying that that generates a hash that you can then work with? Uh, that's more the contextual language okay. understanding. Of it. So yeah. from there, yeah. what parses it into, or does, does that parse it into all the rules you need to build the emails? Like, uh, for example, you said lunch, right? Yeah. What distinguishes between at lunch and for lunch? Because at lunch could be a Skype call during the region, and for lunch could be a tweet. Like, is there a rule set, or is there like a training nurse? Like, what is, how do you classify those different ways of doing things? And if you had, if you found an edge case, how do you add them in? So, a lot of it is, um, so that, that's actually the slide you really want is here, um, which, is the, which is really the expansion of the, of the clue slide, right? Um, and that typically happens during this process, like in the middle of the ontology and the semantic chunking. Um, and really you have, what we're using is, you're using the attributes of these words, right, to kind of figure out what the right thing is to do. So typically what happens is lunch is the, uh, the, the subject, right? Like it's got two properties, right? So it's, it's actually, you model both the fact that it's an event, but you also model the fact that it has time properties, right? Uh, and um, then the, the, the preposition tells you what to do with it, right? But a lot of times you don't actually need to, to be that fine-grained uh, because generally the intent is clear, right? So we're, we're trying to avoid being too picky about grammar because the moment you start doing things on the mobile, grammar goes to, to hell anyway, right? So uh, what we try to do is kind of pick out the sense of the message uh, and then figure it out from there. And, sorry. Sure. If I had EV yeah. and you had EV, yes. would they just go do their thing? So technically it's possible. Uh, it turns out that sometimes people don't like that. Okay. <laughs> Especially if we haven't met before. Yeah. Uh, so typically within a team or within a domain, then, it, then it's, it's usually acceptable to do that. But usually if let's say I want to meet you and I copy EV, uh, E will usually wait for you to come back and say something to say, okay, yeah, let's do this, right? Or if you don't reply, then you will ask you, hey, you know, do you want me to go ahead and confirm this meeting with, with you? Yeah. So a lot of this is, is human factor engineering, in a sense. Yeah. Are you using Gridlet for receiving emails? No, right now we're using um, Mailgun. So, uh, with the Ruby library? To receive emails? Yeah, yeah they've got an API, they, they shoot. Oh, cool. Yeah, they give you a, you get, um, actually it's not even that, it's just a web call. And they handle parsing, so they do some level of parsing for you. So will they tell you the, what is the reply and as opposed to what is the contextual? Yeah, so, so, you know, and we skipped over this, I mean, an email really has a whole bunch of things, right? It's got, it's got the quoted part and it's got the main part. They do, I think when we started out, we used their off-the-shelf algorithm. And then we built a customized version on top of that, and then on top of that, we detect signatures as well. Uh, so, and that's you know, then you do interesting stuff with who's in two fields and CC field. It's all data and context that you use to decide how to respond, right? Yeah. Guys, okay, sorry, we'll, we'll, which one? This, this one. Sorry, I, I, I'm having trouble hearing you. So, do you have like two different programming systems? Like one we use to like understand the language and one actually to generate again what we understood into a language and we may not have been able to solve it. So, my question is are those two completely independent writing systems or we can relate like one, when one system learns enough, we can use uh, math that information in the other end? Yeah, I mean, ideally, ideally, right? You can think of it as a, a translation task, right? You take natural language translate uh, input, human language, translate it into machine language, and then when you're ready, you output machine language and you translate that into human language. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, but yeah, that's some some definitely a kind of a long term area we'd like to kind of work on and figure out how to really kind of unify those two. Because you're right, I mean, they are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Yep.
Because he knows how to do his tail up and like, wow. And there would be a high rate of noise signal when you only care about a very small portion. That seems relevant. Maybe it's like, we'll see. Yeah, so, so that actually is it's kind of part of the challenge, right? Because uh, a lot of times we're not the only recipient in email. I think what you're talking about is like, you know, someone's talking to the other person and then at the end there's a sentence that says, Evie do this, right? But it turns out you have to pay attention to all the other stuff because it has a bunch of contextual clues that tell you what you need to do at the end because people aren't, they, they aren't going to repeat what they said in the, uh, early in the message, right? So they'll, they'll be having a conversation um, about, hey, we should meet here, and we should do this, and talk about that. And then Evie set this up, right? So you really have to read the entire message, and, and um, you know, some of it is just, okay, maybe you discard stuff that's in the past tense, right? For now. At some point, we'll do something interesting with the data, of course. But in the short term, maybe that's not meaningful. You're looking for future-looking events, for example. That's one, one way you could do it. Uh, you could look at who it's addressed to. So part of that is the information synthesis and the graph building, right? So you figure out like there's a bit of dialogue modeling happening as well, right? In a very primitive sense. Yeah. So those are some ways we deal with it. Does EV have a custom email address per person, or just reads to it is based on the two? Does EV have a custom email address? So okay. So um, it generally is a shared like a. Everyone can just email Evie at Nomadic, and we know who you, uh, who we're talking to based on who sent the email. So if I mask my email address, I can fuck it up? If you mask your email address, it doesn't recognize who you are, so it's not going to take instructions from you. If, if I mask my email address to someone else that was a customer? Oh, yeah, sure. Huh. Yeah. Uh, that would potentially be a, a, a risk factor. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, uh, no, but it's, it's, a, it's a great point, right? Uh, and and um, it's... It hasn't been much of an issue yet. I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll, we'll start checking DKM and SPF and making sure that the people who are sending email are verified, right? Yeah. Why is she female? You know, <laughs> I didn't want Evie to be a female name, but <laughs> it's about as gender neutral as you could come up with and yet still be two syllable and could search on the app store for it because at some point, at one point we had an app. Uh, but, um, yeah, at some point, it's going to be just something you can, uh, if you pay enough, you can name your own assistant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm open to suggestions, guys and girls. All right. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, can look for Jin after the meetup. Yeah, or cool. You can, I guess they could email you if they want to. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Thanks, All right. guys. Thank you. Okay.